It is a brand new edition of Flyers Daily, a Monday edition, which is always brought to you by Ticketmaster. Make more memories live. Coming up after Bill Meltzer, we will feature another one of our Flyers hometown assists presented by Wells Fargo uh, in this episode as well. But joining us on Mondays, as he always does, taking a little inventory further after we did goalies and D last week. We do the forwards this week. You read his work on PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, NHL.com, and HockeyBuzz.com. It is Bill Meltzer. Bill, how are you? Doing well. How about you? Were you shocked to see the Toronto Maple Leafs go down in Game Seven? <laughs> I would have. I would have been more surprised to see Toronto ultimately score an overtime and win, and just kind of in their uh, their lot and their lot in life since since expansion, right? I'm getting to the point now, Bill, where I think I feel bad for their fans because it's been 59 years since they beat the Bruins in a playoff series. It's been. Yeah. Uh, since 1967, since they've won the cup and they really haven't had much success, they got a playoff round win last year, but, but got knocked out in the second round by Florida. But you look at it, and like I see everybody posting the pictures of all the fans outside watching the game, yeah. and their heartbreak, and people are, you know, basking in it. The the heartbreak of the Toronto fan. I see a lot of young people there, and I'm going, I don't know if these people all deserve this this kind of pain for an area that loves the game like they do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's not uh, that I want Boston to advance for a whole heck of a lot of no, reasons, but <laughs> no, 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 for sure. Uh, you know, uh, it's funny. I, I was thinking that you know Toronto over the years, you know, since their last cup, last cup appearance, you know, the the final the final year before expansion, they've they've had good players, right? They, you know, they had, they had Sittler and Salming in one era, and they had mm-hmm. Matt Sundin for you know. Doug Gilmore, career. Doug Gilmore, right? Uh, you know now now guys like Matthews and, and Marner and, and uh, Nylander. I mean, they've had talent there. It's yeah. just never come all together at the at, you know, at the same time. Bill, on so. the game winning goal that Pasternak scores, it's kind of a, a a set play. You see him kind of call for it. The the dump that Hampus Lindholm makes and Pasternak gets on his horse, and it didn't look good for a couple of Toronto players. Yeah. The way they reacted to the play taking place, one being Marner, who was right on Pasternak and didn't read it and stay with him, and then Nylander, who was kind of just caught drifting around and watching. And, uh, you know, it, it begs the question, is there going to be change in Toronto? Because there's going to be a lot of teams lined up if they were to, you know, consider – now all these guys have no move clauses, so they'd have to be in on it. But Marner or Nylander, they're not trading Matthews, they're not trading Tavares, but um, when, when you look at it, these guys, if they're available, there's a lot of NHL teams that would love to have their services and try and get them over the hump in the playoffs. No, for sure. Uh, now, you know, I, you mentioned of course a big sticking point being the no movement clauses. Um, you know, they can they can severely limit the number of places they'll go to, and that uh, you know that that affects the the price tag you can fetch. Yeah, for the, for significantly. The yeah. Yeah. Um, so. You know, I, I think there will be changes. I don't think there will be wholesale, tear it down kind of changes because it's hard to make those kind of changes. They already did that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they, they did. They, you know, they, at one point they did anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that the most likely immediate step is once again change coaches. Coach is the easiest guy to take the fall. Um, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know where they, they go from here. Uh, a lot of it is, you know, listen, the way the playoffs are structured these days, everything's a hard, pretty much, you know, pretty much anything is a hard matchup. That 2-3 is always hard, and, yeah. you know, and they, they haven't finished, the, you know, they, they keep falling into that 2-3 kind of situation, and that's that's been one of the main reasons why they can't advance, at least beyond the second round. They did win around one point recently, but. Yeah, I look at it, I go, goaltending didn't do them in either. I thought their goaltending yeah. was fine. Sim so yeah. often in the final game, Walt stepped in. They started three different goaltenders in that series and got wins. So I, that wasn't their issue, although I think you want to put a little bit more competent goaltending, you know, knowing what you're going to get instead of kind yeah. of hoping, which was maybe the, the theme there. We'll see what Brad Tree Living does. I know Danny Briere was spoken to uh, over in Finland, Bill. He's over there, I guess, for the World Championship. Uh, where Joel Faraby is as well. Actually, I saw that. I think he's playing on a line with Kevin Hayes and Johnny Gaudreau um, that uh, Joel Faraby playing. But Danny Briere said, and it's going to lead us to our you know evaluation and, and take some inventory here, uh, that they're looking for goal scoring this offseason in the draft or 
you know, we talked about Cole Eiserman and, you know, he, he does the one thing they don't do well, which is put the puck in the net and help the power play. Um, but Danny Breer not hiding from the fact that they need some goal scorers. And that may come at a cost of that guy not being a great 200 foot player. You got to get over it. Yeah, no, no, for sure. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, and I, there, there are ways you can obtain it, but sometimes it involves other risks too. You mentioned one, the guy might not be a great 200 foot player. Guy might be a year away from unrestricted free agency. And, you know, that, that kind of situation where you're trading some assets off and you might not have them, you know, you might not have them along. I know the Flyers aren't necessarily looking for, you know, older guys, 29, 20, 29 in their 30s. But, you know, they don't, because it, it, obviously the best long term way is through the draft, but those guys take time to develop. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I mean, the, you know, the, I think that uh, when you know, when, I think when you look at the roster this year, they improved a lot structurally, uh, but goal scoring was still an issue, particularly, particularly like scoring off the cycle and those kind of things. The Flyers were such a good team off the rush this year, yeah. But they they're not a very you know they weren't once they were in zone, goals took a lot of work to come by, and the, you know the, that is definitely an area they they absolutely need improvement. Um, particularly when you get in the latter half of the season when, for everybody, it gets harder to score goals yeah. off the rush. So Yeah, yeah, the set offense, if you will. Yeah. Um, th- that wasn't an area they were very good. I remember the year prior looking at them saying so many things have to go right for them to score, yeah. and they've got to work too hard to score. Sometimes you can't have to work hard. Yeah. It's a long year. You, can't, you have to be able to produce goals without having seven things to go right on a checklist and having to work your rear end off every time just to get one. Yeah, yeah. Well, We'll see where Danny goes with with that, and I mean, if a guy like Eiserman's there and say they don't move up in the lottery, which is happening in a, in what a couple of days here, yeah. um, if they don't move up, could you see them maybe moving up a couple of places here, Bill, to go from twelve to eight, twelve to nine, and what is the cost to move up a couple of places? I mean, potentially. I think there might be some guys who might be able to, there might be some goal scoring types that are they're there around twelve. Um, d- depends, you know. Obviously, depends on the you know, the early picks shake out. But you know, like I uh, like I don't know the Cole Eiserman uh, will be there at twelve. Some projections have him there at twelve. Some have him borderline top five. That's the guy who went in the year, you know, potentially top three. And you know, sometimes sometimes when the guy gets scouted that much, I, I thought he was very good. You know, in the uh, 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 under 18s, you know, um, and actually was trying to show he had a more well-rounded game beyond just the goal scoring part of it. Um, but that that's a guy who I think pretty safely projects to be like a 25, 30 goal guy, maybe more. Right. You never know how he develops. But but there are some goal scoring types that are there, um, you know, potentially, potentially around number 12. Um, and yes, yes, he might jump up a few spots, but uh, I don't know. You, you know, there's always so much talk about trading up, and it ever, then it rarely ever actually happens. Yeah, at least, recent, at least recently. So, yeah, it's people don't want to give up another asset to just move yeah. up a couple of spots. The juice has got to be really worth the squeeze to do it. Um, Bill, let's take some inventory up front. We did the goaltenders, we did the D last week. Um, we're kind of taking you know, inventory of the rebuild and where things are. And when we look up front, um, you you know, you have some redundancy there. We talked about that with Scott Lawton and Ryan Paling. Um, But you have, you know, some players like Konechny, who is, is, you know, been consistent the last couple of years. You have guys that are a little inconsistent up there. And maybe Sean Couturier falls into that, although next year I think is a really big year for him to really figure out what he's going to be for the next few years now that he's a total year removed from being back and playing. And then you look at guys like Joel Farabee. So, so when you look up front, what what is the glaring need without kind of going with the low-hanging fruit of high-end talent? But yeah. what do they need more of up front? For years it was they need more speed, right, <laughs> and skill. Obviously, everybody would love speed and skill. It's a great combination. Um, but beyond that, they, they need some players that fit. Into the into the where they're going to play here, so it slots everything correctly. Because I don't feel like that's one thing about this year. I feel like they were slotted incorrectly for a lot of yeah. players at a lot of times. 
No, I, I would agree with that. Uh, to me, you have to start in the middle. Um, you know, you mentioned Couturier. I, I don't know, you know, I don't know what to expect of Sean Couturier moving forward here. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think in, I think particularly in, in points in the second half of the season, you know, I like Ryan Pound was a great addition last off season. And I really like him anywhere, anywhere in your bottom six, especially the fourth line. I mean, he, yeah. you know, Ryan Pelling is the kind of fourth line center that, that teams go a long way with. Because he does, you know, he can do a variety of things or move up for a little while if you need him to. To me, he played too much in the top six, you know, for for ideally, right? Yeah. Um, you know, with, you're talking about a little bit of redundancy with, with Lawton and, and Pelling. You know, I mean, Lawton can also play wing. Um, you know, I. So I, I don't know if you move Scott Lawton back to a left wing if if that helps. Uh, whether they'll ultimately keep Noah Cates on a wing or, or maybe put him back in the middle again. Um, you know, I, I think Morgan Frost's sweet spot is that middle six somewhere. Um, yeah, he's second right, line center to me. Yeah, I, I think he can be too. Yeah. I think he can be a second line center. Um, I, I, I think sometimes, you know, I, I think sometimes people say second line center, you know, and they're thinking of like a one B, like, a, you know, like a, like a Crosby and Malkin kind of thing, one A and one B. Um, but you know, not every team has that luxury. I, I, I think Frost is the kind of a more old school second line center where he's, he's not, he's not a guy you're going to, you know, slide up long term to your, to your one guy. But I think he does enough things well, get him the right line mates, distributes the puck well, those kind of things. I think he'd be fine on a second line you know, with, uh, you know, I'd like I'd like to see him stay with Tippett. Me too. And I then Tippett provides him space. Yeah, and and just uh, you know, then the, the guy would fit on on the other side, whether Tippett plays left side or or right. Um, so I, but so you know, the the thing is that the Flyers have four legitimate NHL centers. Um, but the problem, as you said, is with slotting, and you know who who plays where. Um, so you know it, it's easier said than done to get a true one C. Yeah. I don't know when you'll be able to get that, but uh, but I think that uh, as a long term priority, that that the guy who fills that one C slot is uh, a big need. Everything else will snap in place around it. Yeah. And even even guys playing a little bit lower in the lineup, it'll help their production too because it helps them match up wise sometimes. Yeah, totally. Um, That's the trickle down effect. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, uh, you know, I, I think going forward, that that's one of your biggest needs um, in terms of the, on the wing. You do need more goal scoring, without a doubt. Um, you know, now I I think that uh, you know can. Can you get Tippett from twenty eight goals to thirty two? I think you can. You know, um, I, I think Forrester could be that twenty five thirty goal guy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I there, there's nobody. You know, even, even connect me. You know, who you know, but this is our forty plus goal guy. They're they're not going to have that for a while. Now, now Mitchkov is going to cut. You know, when he comes in, whatever, whatever that may be, Mitchkov will be a. Uh, will be an asset, can contribute in different ways, both scoring goals and setting them up. Uh, he's, he's a dynamic offensive talent. But, um, you know, I, I, I think that... I think getting pieces that fit around what you have. Um, you know, guys who can... Um, you know, maybe... You know, one of the things that uh, that John LeClaire always did well, people always think it was net front. One of the things LeClaire did really well was he stepped out from behind the net and scored a pretty fair amount too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just some guy who's like a real down low threat to score. They haven't they haven't had that in a while, really. You know, really since Wayne Simmons was in his, was in his yeah. prime. Um, you know, uh, Cardinal could do a little bit of that. Uh, you know, and then Chen was a good bumper guy in the power play, which is something else they need too. Um, so they, you know, they, I, they definitely have needs up front. They don't have anybody you would say is just that, that, you know, the guys who are just the top of the league offensive talents, you have to develop those. And, and so it's, uh, for the most part, 
You know, you're, they're, they're not going to generally fall in your lap. So the Flyers got to keep working to find those guys. I don't know. If, I don't know this off season. Um, well, you know, certainly not on the free agent market, Jason. Um, you know, maybe they can try to put a package together for a for a high end forward who, again, is. But that has to also fit the timeline. Yeah. You know, it, it also has to fit. Uh, you know, contract wise, there's there's a lot of things that that have to fit to be able to bring one of those guys in. But in terms of generic needs, certainly, uh, you know, certainly a guy who can finish. I, th- I think another guy who can who can s- contribute in the cycle and can score down low, maybe a net, be, be a true net front guy on a power play. Yeah, that, can't be uh, Garnet Hathaway. No, no. Uh, That's uh, where the slotting – Yeah. It, it, like, he does, he, he, Garnet Hathaway, no offense to him. No. Uh, he's not a power play. Guy. No, say yeah, no, 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 that's the same, you know, same thing we were just talking about with Ryan Paling. Great yeah. player, great to have him in the lineup. I don't, you know, he, he's not necessarily the guy that you want on, <laughs> you know, he's, he's not, he's not, not the guy you really want in your top six, not really the right power play guy. Now, I mentioned an example, um, I mentioned it on, on Twitter that sometimes you have to make do with a little less, particularly a PP2, you can. Um, and I mentioned an example of Ryan White. Who was a fourth line winger his whole career, but the Flyers had a need and they, they stuck him net front for ten games at the end of the season, and they had three power play goals in those final ten games. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's you know you don't have to have the, the most talent to do it, but uh, you have to have the right guys around them though too because he's strictly, strictly a role to play. His role was to screen the goalie and maybe there's a rebound he could bang in or he might deflect something. Um, you know you really need. You really need that guy with the natural hands and the willingness and the ability to do it, um, but that that would ser- that would certainly help having having that net front presence that real you know, getting the puck down low and you know kind of kind of like what Anders Lee does for the Islanders. Yeah, um, big body and, too. Yeah, yeah, the the big body, big and strong. Uh, you know, one I think one of the reasons why the, the Flyers have always had problems with the Islanders is they've had trouble matching up with Anders Lee specifically. Yeah, people look at, at Barzal and his puck skills. But I was like at Anders Lee, you can't get him off the puck behind the boards. He wins all those battles, and when he's net front, you can't move him from there. And, and it's not only that he'll pick up some goals there, but it's what it does to the goaltending to open it up for other guys to score yeah. from the outside exactly. when he's there. I mean, you have to be around the goalie in today's game, and e- even in today's game, you'll still take a beating down there, but you got to be willing to go there. Bill, you mentioned Cates. Um, I got the sense in talking to Torts late in the season that um, I think he was a little reluctant, but I, I think that he thinks that Cates is a winger. And we know that, you know, the first year where he played center when Couturier was out the whole year and he had a really good defensive year, and yeah. a little bit of offense came at the end of the year. This year it was kind of sideways for him. And then, you know, obviously he has the injury heated up a little bit at the very end of the season. Yeah. Um but with Couturier here, assuming Couturier is, you know, as I guess what we'll say is healthy and is in the lineup game in and game out, that almost becomes redundant too because they kind of do the same thing of checking the opposition's top yeah. players. Yeah. No, exactly. Um, and, and in so many cases where, you know, where you talk about what a team needs, it, it's like you look at the existing roster – and it, it's not that these guys can't play, and it's not that these guys aren't legitimate NHL players. It's all about it's all a roster assembly and how the pieces all fit together and why a line works or doesn't work. Um, you know, one, one of the things with a with a successful line with chemistry is you have to have guys who bring different elements to it. Defined roles, right? Absolutely defined roles, yeah. Mm-hmm. You have to have your distributor, right? You, you have to have your... Your F one really good four checker goes in, creates pressure, right? You have to have uh, and a guy who's a, a shoot first guy. I mean that that's uh, kind of that's kind of the gold standard. You have the shooter, the playmaker, and and the mucker, you know, with, with some talent too. But I mean, you know, and obviously the more elements that one guy has, some guys can add multiple elements. You want some size, some speed, you know, whatever whatever else you can add into the mix. But I think those are those are your three basics: a guy who will win the puck. Uh, who can pass the puck and your shooter, and 
Look so. no further than the Bergeron, Marshan, Pasternak line yeah. of many years. It was the yeah. best line in the league. Exactly. And because you had a center that had the hockey IQ as high as anybody in the game, could play a great 200-foot game and had the offensive skills. Then you had Marshan who would just go in and do whatever he could for a board battle, could score the goals too. But then you have the shooter in Pasternak who just creates so much attention to defend because of the shot that it opens it up for the other guys. That's the chemistry of a great line in hockey for sure. Um, Bill, where does Bobby Brink fit in to this equation? I know he's playing with the Phantoms right now. Got stopped on a penalty shot, as a matter of fact, uh, in in uh, game two against Hershey where the Bear, the Bears ended up beating uh, uh, the Phantoms. I think 5-1 was the final. Now they're up two games to none, and uh, the, uh, the Phantoms are on the brink of elimination. But where does Brink fit in? You know, he's had moments where, you know, he scored some big goals for the team this year. Obviously, yeah. he was scratched. He was sent down. He He's put some things on tape that were really good and some things that um, maybe need to certainly clean up. No, for sure. And I, I think Brink is another guy. I think his sweet spot is in the middle the middle six of a lineup. Um, if he's in the fourth line, I, I, I don't see where he could be effective in that role. And I, I don't think that he brings, you know, enough consistency and enough speed to really be a, a top line guy. So, in, in the right mix, he fits in your middle six somewhere. But I, I don't, I don't know with who. I, you know, they they had him, for example, for a while with, with Frost, and I thought they were there's a little bit of redundancy there. You have two pass first guys, both a little bit small, right? I didn't, I didn't, you know, every once in a while they make a really nice play together, but. But I didn't, you know, I didn't. I didn't think they were the right line mates for one another. Um, you know, I if you had an, you had another skilled center somewhere to to put him with, I, I that 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 would help. Um, but I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where he fits in yeah. the lineup. And again, I I think with I think in the right combination, there's a fit. But uh, you know, I, I don't know if those pieces are there right now. It's funny that you say that because as I go back and I look at my my notebook from very early in the season, I think it's only the second page of this notebook that I decided to use. And I did my bold predictions, which we'll get to in a second. But one of the things that I thought was I wrote down as an important element of this year was staying healthy, finding out more about player development. And then the third thing I had written down was combinations of chemistry. Right. And I don't that's one thing that I even though the Flyers took a step forward, markedly better in the standings, played 82 meaningful games. I don't know that we found out a lot about combinations of chemistry. And I don't mean all three forwards. A lot of times it's just two. Yeah. And then a third guy kind of cycles through there as, you know, a line goes good and then it dries up and then you make a change. But usually there's, you know, combinations of two forwards with a third to be determined. And I don't feel like we found that this year, in particular with Tippett, with Frost, with Brink, and with Forster. Those yeah. are, I I don't know who they're best suited to play with. No, I I, I think that uh, that Tippett and Frost have had stretches where they played really well together. Um, you know the, the the thing is is that that Frost is I mean Tippett creates a large percentage of his chances are created by himself. Yeah, um, which makes him you know not a hard line mate to play with because he's selfish. I wouldn't say selfish at all, but I would say he's not necessarily a a find a seam, get open, and, and send him, you know, passes him for a one timer kind kind of a, a line mate. Um, it, it's more like a lot of times uh, a defenseman might get him the puck, you know, all the way back in the D zone or or in the neutral zone, and he'll just take it from there. He'll yeah. just take it to all the you know all the way to the house himself. Um, so you know, while, while I do think that uh, he and Frost have generally worked well together, I don't know that they're, they're the perfect line mates for for each other. But uh, yeah, I I would say kind of kind of for all of those guys. Uh, actually, when they had that, when they had a line of Konechny, uh with with Frost and Tippett, and there was a little you know there's some something to give defensively there yeah. with that trio. But they they had stretches they they looked really good together, um, you know. But it's but I I, I still think right now you want to have Konechny on your top line. Um, they they don't have you can in a little. Bit of, Pasternak type, uh, you know, connecting connecting is a first line guy certainly on this team and, and on a number of teams too. But yeah, um, yeah I, I think long term finding finding those top end combinations. I think in the lower end, 
You know, the, I, it seemed that uh, like like Hathaway and Paling work really well together. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and they for a long time, you know, for for at least for a while, you know, significant stretch of time, they had Cates uh, on their other wing, and then that combo seemed to work well. But but on the upper end of the lineup, they're going to consistently create chances and you know, generate offense for you. I think that is still very much a work in progress, and and it's all about getting the right pieces. Well, I'd love to see a fourth line of Paling, Cates, and Hathaway. To yeah. me, I, I coined the phrase for that line this year when they did put them together, set it and forget it. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry about the – just when you're figuring out your who's playing with who, set that one and don't even worry about it. Then yeah. mix up all the other ones all you want. Uh, I, I think the thing is you just got to find out what skill sets kind of accentuate another player's strengths, and that's the key thing to figure out. One of the things we found out this year, though, Bill, in what was deemed as Tyson Forster's rookie season was that he is a much better 200-foot player than a yes. lot of us ever thought he would be. And the goal scoring, it came, um, you know, and good on him for, you know, staying with it when he wasn't scoring goals because a lot of times players like him, when they're not scoring, they are net negative. He never turned into a net yeah. negative player. He finished the year playing over 17 minutes a night, and he was even in plus minus. He ends up with the 20 goals. Uh, but the future for a player like Tyson Forster after a full NHL season, 77 games this year under his belt, um, looks a lot brighter than maybe we even thought it would. No, no, for sure. For sure. Um, because he, you know, as you just said, even even when he's not scoring, he still is contributing to other things. Really good in board battles. Really good in 50-50 pucks. Just heavy on the stick. Very heavy on the stick, yeah. right? Can't, can't get the puck away from him. When he has it, um, and you know, he'll never be a speedster, but he he work he works with what he has just fine, and you know, he, he went through significant stretches where he was getting to the scoring areas. Early on, he wasn't, I didn't think, and yeah. then they started doing that. The goals still weren't coming, but you know, the, um, he had a couple of really hot stretches. I mean, you know, when when you look, when you look at his progression, being a little bit streaky has always been part of his mo offensively. Um, even with the Phantoms, um, so I think I I think he'll be a player you're going to have to live with. You know, there might be stretches where he goes with 12 games without a goal, as long as he's doing other things. I I, I think I think the goal is, and, and most you know most goal scorers are a little bit streaky anyway, is that rather than going through a stretch where he might have one goal in 15 games, shortening that a little bit, right? Shortening that to about eight. Yeah, and uh, yeah, at the end of the year, you're you're looking at a significant number of goals because of the hot streaks, and just just avoid those those long droughts, and that that comes with experience. But I, I thought that he had a a really really strong first year, no doubt. Yeah, I, I think if he can do that, if he can shrink those droughts to eight nine games tops, you're looking at 32 goals. Yeah, exactly. Player. I, I yeah. think that's where you know that's kind of the sweet spot of maybe an expectation for next year. And, and the other thing with him too is I thought he deferred a little bit on shooting. And we know how, you know, the hockey culture is. Hey, I'm the young new guy here. Um, I got to defer to the veteran, so here I'll pass it to you. I, I thought we started to see in the last third of the year, like I I, I kind of said this to his line mates at one point, are you, enc- you know, encouraging him to shoot? And they're like, we're telling him to shoot nonstop because that's, his, that's what he was drafted in the first round on is that yes. shot and that release. And we saw – a couple goals that he scored in the, in the final third, where you go, Oof, that yeah. he, he deceptive release, good shot, and uh, I I just want to see more of it. I don't want to see him. Def- yeah. He's not a playmaker. Don't be. Don't try and be a playmaker. Be a shooter. Be a trigger no, guy. No, for sure. And and we know where his sweet spot is. It's the top of the circle down to the dot. Um, yep. You know, and his you know his shooting percentage from those areas. Somebody just posted the other day. It, it was uh, it was impressive. He scores you know, an impressive number of goals from those areas. He just has to get himself to those areas and get, get him the puck. You know? Willingness but, too, right? Yeah, the willingness. The willingness. Because a lot of times he would get the puck up up top in the circle or, or whatever. And he would he might go back to the point with it. You know? So Yeah, he was definitely a bright spot from this year, uh, to be sure. So uh, we'll see how it all plays out. Nook Delarie, Bill. I mean had a lot of popcorn this year, spent a lot of time in the yeah. press box. Um, it, it just looked this year, especially for a team that played so fast in transition, that um, the game's speed 
is no longer uh, palatable for his lack there of it. No, he, he definitely. And, and the funny thing was, early in the season, the first 10 games or so, Nick oh. was really good. You know, they, uh, that, that so-called PhD line when they were together. Uh, the, 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 uh, you know, Nick was certainly pulling his weight. But, uh, but I do think the speed, the speed and pace caught up to him. A little bit as the season went on, you know, it's never a question of work ethic or willingness. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I and you know, there's there's still there's still some term on this contract. So even even, even if he's your third, twelfth, or thirteenth forward, he still can be a valuable team guy in that way, and he'll never complain about it either. Yeah. You know, you don't have to like it, but he's not going to complain about it. He's not going to yeah. be a distraction. Um, last guy to ask you about Bill has been the polarizing figure of this all season. It's not Morgan Frost for a change. It is Joel Farabee. We mentioned kind of earlier uh, is over in Worlds playing right now. Uh, but Joel Farabee, you know, the, it has the year where career high in goals, career high in points, 22-28 for 50 points. Um, we know, you know, how his last 40% of the season went. Yeah. Um, but he's a guy that you really have to wonder about here. And we talk about those combinations of chemistry and where they fit, and I just don't know a good answer to it. I don't know, you know, in, in trying to his, uh, assess Joel's season, I don't want to throw out the first half because he was consistently good until the All-Star break. He, yeah. he, he, he had no long, you know, no long slumps in the first half. Consistently good. Um, that, that's obviously the, where the bulk of his production came. And, and he then, was not off the rush. He was scoring around the net. He was scoring around that, and he was one guy that was actually yeah, getting to the, the dirty areas around the mm-hmm. net, banging in a lot of rebounds, you know, and, and uh, you know, contributing in other ways too. Um, but I, I, I thought that really in the first half of the season, showing that he was over the neck injury and was producing at a, at a good clip, and a lot of this too, Jason was five on five production. Where it's yeah, you know, I mean. You know, those are real, 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 the hard points tend to be earned. Not now, of course, with the Flyers, the power play is a whole other issue. But, but just in general, a guy can consistently produce at five on five. You know, is a guy who deserves a lineup spot. Um, in the second half, I thought for a while he was still doing the same things, and the points dried up for a while, and then he looked like he, you know, then he looked, then he looked like he. I, I don't know what happened from there, but there, there was so a he stretch. lost his way. Yeah, yeah. He, he lost his way because he he wasn't getting a ton of chance. He wasn't around the net like like he had been earlier, um, and it, it just kind of dried up, um, you know. And then there, there, there were little there there games where it was where it was back, like the game in Boston. We had mm-hmm. two goals. Um, the game of the Flyers had the big comeback that fell just short. Um, you know, that looked like he looked in the first half of the season. So I'm not going to just throw out the first half of the season. But considering that he was healthy most of the year, um, yeah, really, he was healthy pretty much, I guess, the whole year this year, as far as we know. The second half was a disappointment. Um, And I I don't know. I don't know. Is he a guy they might move this offseason? I don't know. You know, I I often go back, and I I tend to, you know, I guess, not a preference, but I – I tend to hang on longer to guys that you drafted and developed. Yep. Maybe, maybe it's just a, maybe it's just a, uh, I, I don't know what it is. It's definitely you a person invested problem. in the player. <laughs> you, you invest in the player, right? Yeah. You, you watch them develop in his case through a year of collegiate hockey, a little, a very short period with the Phantoms as a rookie getting his first 20 goal year in, in the COVID year, the next year. And you see it coming, see it coming, the neck injury, the, then the first half this year, there's enough there that I know there's a player there, Right. Um, but where all the pieces fit, I don't know. I, I, that's part of why going this off season, Joel, just being one example, I think you have to be open to a lot of different possibilities as to who you might move around, who you might keep speaking personally. I don't know. I, you know, I, I've said this about frost. I'll say it about Farabee. Sometimes the best trades you make are the ones you don't make yeah. and just finding other, you know, finding other pieces that maybe you can fit with. And then maybe maybe you, maybe it's a solution you already have in house. I don't know. Yeah, it's gonna be he's gonna be a, a some, definitely someone that's gonna be talked about 
uh, around yeah. NHL circles. And I have a feeling his name is going to be burning in the embers of a lot of yeah. trade conversations. So uh, we'll monitor that as we go. Bill, great stuff. We're going to get to my bowl predictions uh, next week because we certainly had a plenty to discuss and taking inventory of the forwards in this episode. In the meantime, though, read Bill's work at PhiladelphiaFlyers.com, NHL.com, and HockeyBuzz.com. And today we're going to the dogs. Let's uh, talk with the people from the pet friendly dog breakery. Let's this week we're going to the dogs. Let's talk with the great people from the pet friendly dog bakery. I love people who bake goods for dogs and pets. So here's my conversation. Flyers hometown assist winner. It is another edition of Flyers Daily. It is the off season and a great chance for us to feature some great small business small business owners in the uh, Philadelphia area who were rewarded with the Flyers' hometown assist, which is presented by Wells Fargo. Now, the winners have been selected, and they're going to receive $100,000 in marketing assets to promote their small businesses as their prize. And we love featuring local small businesses. And the one we're featuring today goes right to my heart. Maybe not my belly, because I don't eat dog treats, but I love dogs, and everybody knows we do hockey and hounds. And I love people who treat dogs the right way. With us is Stephanie Johnson. She is the owner of the Pet Friendly Dog Bakery at 4324 Main Street in Philadelphia uh, in Mattyunk. And she joins us right now. Stephanie, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. This is amazing. (laughs) Where did the, uh, I always like to go, where did the seeds get planted? Where did the germ of an idea begin to start the dog bakery? I wish I could take credit for it, but I can't. I was hired as the general manager store um, of the bakery. It's it's like a bakery and a boutique. Um, In 2017 into 2018, the previous owners, it was like their brainchild. Um, I used to work for Petco. I worked there for 14 years. And then I started working at a, a restaurant. And when this opportunity came up, I was like, no brainer. <laughs> it's yeah. both of my favorite things, food and dogs. So uh, I applied, I got hired, I worked there for five years, and then they were selling the business and I bought it. Wow. That's and cool I bought story. the building notes and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty awesome. It's like a dream come true. <laughs> yeah, this journey, you, you work around animals so much. And the opportunity presents itself, and then boom! All of a sudden, you own the building, you own this, the dog bakery. Um, first of all, tell people about your website because your website's great. It's uh, petfriendlydogbakery dot com, and when you get there, y- you can set up delivery. And what are the services that you know pet owners can can take advantage of by visiting the website? So you can actually send your treats anywhere, to, or send our treats anywhere in the U.S. Um, it takes, you know, max a week to get them because we make them fresh per order. So you're not getting treats that have been sitting around for like six months. You're getting treats that are baked like for you. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, you can send like a care package to a friend or family member. Um, you can, uh, you can see like events that are happening in the store on our website um we do have a blog that we're working on (laughs) it's not fully created yet but we're working on it um yeah and um what else what else what else like special occasions for dogs too birthdays and you can customize their cake or their their treat yeah we do yeah we do full customization i do a ton of gender reveal cakes for people who are having a baby that want their dog to be part of it as well (sighs) great so like the dog licks the ice thing off and it shows the color underneath and yeah like pretty much if you have an idea at, for for something fun and you want someone creative to try to make it for you um it's us like we're the ones <laughs> oh, that's cool and like the creativity can go you, you can go wild with it yeah yeah like we have i mean like i said we have like cakes people will send me pictures of cakes they found online I do my very best to recreate them um, in a dog safe fashion. Um, yeah. So if you have an idea, send it to me. I love like, you know, I'm a big Star Wars nerd. So like I love doing Star Wars stuff. <laughs> like yeah, I love too. all that stuff, you know. Do the Ewok cake. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the Stormtrooper. Like I have a white English cream. She, she's like a Stormtrooper. That's pretty nice. cool. Nice, yeah. Uh, 
So, so you guys also have an event space as well. Uh, we do. Is, that, is that for like doggy parties? Yes. So we uh, we specialize in dog birthday parties. We have had a wedding down there too um, mm. <laughs> in our event space. But um, but during like the spring, summer, fall, we do a lot of free events too, where you can bring your dog. We do like breed events. We do um, like foam parties. If you've ever seen like <laughs> like you know like raves do foam parties, we do them yeah. for dogs. Uh, they go nuts! <laughs> I, I guarantee they go crazy. They actually, 90% of them are like, nah, not going in there. Um, their parents end up like, I'll take like squeaky balls. I'll, I'll bring down like a bunch of squeaky balls and toss them in the foam. And usually they'll jump in and it makes for great reels and like, and fun stories and stuff on your social. Yep. But 99% of them don't want to go in there. Um, I don't, I don't think that they want to go in a space where they don't, can't see where their feet are, I guess. Yeah. Is what I'm thinking. But once they're in there, they're like, "Oh, this is fine." But like getting in them, getting them in there is like hard. <laughs> yeah. You got to have that initial really daring dog that'll do anything to, yes, to kind of start yeah. them off. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do have some dogs that come to every single phone party and they love it. And then the other dogs are like, "All right, maybe." Um, but yeah. usually, if you throw like a toy that they really want in there, they'll follow. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have you do feature these events in your social media channels. Let's give everybody your Instagram because you can see a lot of the great stuff there. Yeah, it's just it's pet friendly dog bakery. Um, is our Instagram? It's our Facebook. Um, our threads. Everything's just pet friendly dog bakery. So yeah, go check that out as well. Let, let me ask you about you know being a part of this this program with the Flyers and you know the assist, the Flyers hometown assist and uh, you yeah. know how did that how did that link up and and what does that do for you? So uh, we've been Flyers fans, like my family and I have been, I don't know if you can see, like this is my husband's uh, man cave. It's Flyers themed. We have a Danny Breer uh, um, bobblehead. bobblehead. Yeah, I see Danny right <laughs> we there. We used to have, uh, yeah, we used to have um, season tickets and then we had, we had our baby and then she ended up, by the time she was like four, I guess, it wasn't like kosher to like keep her on our lap anymore. We couldn't really afford an extra ticket. Yeah. So we we uh, we gave them away, but um, but yeah, we've been we've been fans for forever. Of course, when Gritty came out, it just it was just like the best. I love Gritty; he's like my favorite guy ever. Um, but yeah, so we've been fans, and then um, one of my customers who is like a really big fan as well let me know about the program. I didn't even know about it, and I just I you know put in my info and totally forgot about it over the holiday. And then I get this email that I was chosen. I'm like, I literally was like jumping up and down. <laughs> I was so excited. Yeah. So it's yeah, fun. we, it's, it's been awesome. It's funny because in the organization, um, do, the dogs are featured kind of everywhere. We've done, I, we've done, you know, games with dogs on the ice at the at the building in past seasons. I do a show weekly with John Tortorello, the Flyers head coach, hockey and hounds. So we're we're trying to get dogs rescued, and and you know, you go to the Flyers training center, and if you walk in the office space, people have their dogs in their office and doggy doors up. It, it's a very pet friendly organization, and I always have said this that I believe that. Uh, you can tell a lot about a person by the animals they keep company with. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I trust, I usually trust anybody who has a pet. Yeah. <laughs> people Treats who are like, correctly. oh, like my cat, like if people who are like, I don't like cats. I'm like, have you ever like spent time with a cat? <laughs> you hung out with a cat? <laughs> yeah. Like it's actually pretty dope. And like my dog is down here on the floor. She's just waiting for me to take her for her afternoon walk. <laughs> She's just annoyed with me right now. But, um, but yeah, like, um, it's always been like a part of my life and I'm really happy that the flyers are really behind it too. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Again, you can visit the website. It's pet friendly dog And, uh, you know, you guys, people do so much for their pets and the pets give you so much without even knowing they do it. 
and uh, visiting the website and checking out all the great treats and toys and the events that you have is a great place for people uh, to find out more information. So again, visit www.petfriendlydogbakery.com, Pet Friendly Dog Bakery on social channels and threads, Instagram and Facebook as well. You can see pictures and uh, videos of the events and, and learn more as well. Stephanie, thanks for doing this. Uh, best of luck coming up and we really appreciate it. Have a great Thank summer. You so much. Thanks. You too. There you go. Another Flyers Hometown Assist winner. We'll feature our final one coming up on Wednesday's episode. It'll be Mango Tree. So join us then. Everybody, have a great Monday. We'll talk to you Wednesday on a brand new Flyers Daily.